Good afternoon, everybody. Dr. Erlinson's a hard act to follow, so I'm going to attempt to do my best to do it justice. Um, I want to say a quick thank you to Lisa Thomas Barnett for allowing me to participate in this session. Um, today I'm going to talk about the um, unmodified modified avian remains that were recovered from the SNI-14 box cache. Um, I'm going to do my best to explain the ecology of the species present and also the style of the artifacts that we recovered. This is a photo of the contents of the West box before they were excavated. Um, 19 avian elements were recovered from within this box. One um, complete but fragmented um, avian cranium with the maxilla and mandible still intact was recovered from outside of the West box. Um, and all the bird bones from this cache were recovered from within this box. Uh, the 19 elements that were recovered um, include six hairpins. Let's see, this is the pointer. So there's the hairpins, um, four bone pendants, two whistles, and then uh, eight unmodified bird bones. Uh, this is just a quick look at the avian species present within the redwood box cache. Um, all of these species pictured here can be found in Alaska and on the Aleutian Islands. Um, although some of those are rare occurrences and others of those are either vi frequent visitors or their residents to that area of the world. Um, all of these, with the exception of the stellar sea eagle, which is that one up there, um, can also be found throughout the year or at certain times visiting um, San Nicolas Island. So that is a short-tailed albatross, Canada goose, bald eagle, stellar sea eagle, and then a great blue heron. Um, bald eagles are found all along the western coast of North America. They can be found in certain times of the year in Alaska and the surrounding islands and in coastal areas of California, Oregon, and Washington. There are historical records of bald eagles breeding on the Channel Islands, but the populations were extirpated um, by DDT in the 1950s. In the early 2000s, the Park Service uh, started a repopulation program, and it's been very successful up until this point to getting breeding bald eagles back on the Channel Islands. Uh, Short-tailed albatross breed off the coast or off islands off the coast of Japan, and in recent years we've gotten breeding pairs off of Midway, and um, they tend to spend all of the months that are non-breeding, so basically our winter months, um, out coasting the Pacific Ocean, and they will spend months and months at sea without landing back on land. But we have seen them off the coast of California recently. I think. I've heard from biologists on Zandnik that they've seen them in the last couple months. Um, so while breeding adult males and females will return to their islands of origin to breed, young males will spend two years at sea. So we do see them year round off the coast of the Channel Islands. The Canada goose is found in um, the Arctic and temperate regions of North America. For the most part, they're found year round in Alaska and in Canada. But we do see them during their wintering season when they fly south um, across the western coast of North America. Um, and they have been spotted on the Channel Islands. In fact, I've actually seen one out there. So this is something that we would have been able to find on San Nicolas. The great blue heron is the largest of the herons that are in North America. And they breed all up and down the west coast of North America. And I've I've seen them on the Channel Islands. I've seen them on San Nicolas, right outside on NAFAC. They're all over the place. Um, they have been seen in the Alaska and the surrounding islands, but it, they've never nested there. So they're not an indigenous species to that area. The stellar sea eagle is one of the largest raptors in the world. And these birds can be found on the western edge of the Pacific Ocean. Um, mostly around the eastern coasts of Japan and Russia and the surrounding islands of that area. And um, vagrant individuals have been seen in Alaska and in the islands off the coast of Alaska, like the Kodiak Islands, the Aleutian Islands, and places like that. And actually, these bones were recovered at Fort Ross. Um, but we've never actually, they've never come far south as the Channel Islands. Um, this identification isn't entirely 100% yet. It's the bones, there's no way the bones could be anything else, but we haven't actually had gotten a comparative specimen to do the final 
comparison for. These are the eight unmodified bones that were recovered from either within the West Box or surrounding the West Box. We have a, a right and a left ulna from a bald eagle. Um, we have the mandible and the maxilla plus the cranial parts from a great blue heron. A left tibiotarsus from a bald eagle. A left tibiotarsus from a probable stellar sea eagle. And we have a right and a left femur from a bald eagle. The five bald eagle elements that were recovered from within this cache appear to be from the same individual based on the relative size of the bird, um, the presence of both re left and right elements, and of course the fact that there are similar pathologies on the bones. Um, it's important to note though that these specimens dwarfed our modern comparative collection. They were compared against two Alaskan juvenile or young adult male birds, and these were huge in comparison. So it's possible that these were our female bald eagles because the females of the species are 10% larger than males, but it could also be that this population during this time period was just a lot larger than our modern populations. Um, also, it's important to note that right up in here and at the bottom of the ulnas, there was a moderate osteoarthritis, so we are dealing with an older individual. Um, So this eagle suffered an infection in the left leg elements that were recovered from this cache. The joint of the femur and the tibiotarsus experienced an extreme trauma, such as a break, that would have led to an infection that all but destroyed this proximal end of the tibiotarsus. A bone infection of this nature would have taken a while to manifest itself in such a severe nature. And there's no evidence of rehealing in these areas, so we know that it, this bird wasn't sick for very long. This infection probably would have severely debilitated the bird's ability to hunt, to forage, and probably to take flight, um, which would have left it probably starving and seriously weakened, which would have been able, they, the natives probably would have been able to pick it up fairly easily. And it's also possible this was scavenged after death. So this is the great blue heron cranium, and this was recovered from outside of the west box. Um, these elements are in poor shape due to wind and erosion. Um, Dale Sargentson has mentioned that bird bills and bird craniums have been recovered from caches and finds across the world. And we've found similar caches with uh, bills in them from the Channel Islands and from San Nicolas specifically. One of these caches was recovered at the SNI-25 or the Tule Creek Village site with Dr. Volana with talked about this morning. And it was found with a quartzite crystal, a large abalone pendant, and an avian humerus. Well, we, little, we know little why about this cranium was saved. We do know that it was important enough for someone to store it with these artifacts. This is the left tibiotarsus that probably belongs to a stellar sea eagle. The robustness and overall size of this element has excluded it from all other possible raptors. The structure and muscle attachments and the size and shape of for important foramen closest match other eagles. CSULA is in the process of getting um, a loan permit for a stellar sea eagle from the Smithsonian so that we can firm up this ID. This is a cut um, humerus from a bald eagle. And as you can see, there are the cut marks right there. This was cut using the traditional Channel Island saw and snap technique that we see across the Channel Islands. Um, and it would have made the perfect whistle preform. These are the four elongate bird bone pendants. Two were recovered from within the jewelry cache and the other two were recovered from within the West Box. Um, this style of pendant is common to Southern California and the Channel Islands. Pendants of this type have been described in Gifford's Californian Bone Artifacts and in Hudson and Blackburn's Material Culture of the Chumash Interaction Sphere. These are the pendants found within the jewelry box, which were contained within the West Box. 
These are the pendants that came from outside of the jewelry box. Richard Gutenberg will be talking more in depth about these later um, in his talk about ornamentation. These are the six hairpins from within the West box. Five of these hairpins were made from short-tailed albatross radii. And we have at least three individuals represented within the sample. Um, they were formed, or they were made by cutting off the distal and proximal ends and then grind, abrading the distal portion down to a point. Um, it's important to note that this one has striations all along the shaft. They're just very tiny striations up and down the entire shaft of that bone. And something similar to that was described by Gifford in Californian Bone Artifacts. So they have found ones like that before. And then the one on the end was, is an unknown bird, but it is a long bone that we weren't able to identify because they actually took the shaft and split it in half and then abraded the distal end to a point. So we, can't, we don't have enough of that bone left to actually identify it to species. And these are the two whistles, the complete whistles that were found within the box cache. They are formed in a tradi the simple traditional style of the Channel Islands. Um, whistles from bird bone have been made on the channel, or seen on San Nicolas, on the Channel Islands, throughout California, and really all over the world. The hollow nature of avian bone makes it a perfect material for constructing whistles and flutes. Hudson and Blackburn have described whistles of this plain style from San Nicolas Island, as well as Gifford, but in Californian bone artifacts, Gifford does only focus on ones that were ornately decorated with shell and beads. And these are just very simple. And the first of these whistles was constructed from an ulna of a Canada goose. The distal and proximal ends of this bone were used using the saw and snap technique. Um, as you can see, there are spots where the asphaltum is still adhered to the dermis on the dorsal side of this whistle. Right up in here. That's, this may indicate that at one point this whistle may have been coated in asphaltum to allow for the inlay of ornamentation or other objects. This is the short-tailed albatross whistle. Um, this whistle was made from the ulna of a short-tailed albatross. The distal and proximal ends were removed using that same saw and snap technique. And as you can see um, on the dorsal side, there are patches of that asphaltum, which may, may indicate that it was coated as well. But the really interesting thing is that this part right here, that patch has actually been abraded down to allow them to incise the triple X pattern. Um, this triple X pattern has actually been found from several artifacts on the channel, or on San Nicolas Island, I should say. Um, this is actually, where is it? This is an artist rendering of the red pipe that was found within the box cache. And this is a surface collected donut stone where you see that they've actually inlaid the, the triple X pattern three times. And at the bottom, this is a drawing from Hudson and Blackburn of a, I think it was a pink shale pipe. So with future research, we hope to be able to conduct isotope um, analysis and DNA on the bald eagles from this site to see if we can tell um, where their diets were from or if we can link them to a genetic population. There is a very large um, historic and modern bald eagle uh, isotope test going on right now with Paul Collins from the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum. I know they need samples, so hoping we can get it in on this project. I might also like to visit um, the comparative collections of other museums in Southern California and get a chance to look at other whistles and hairpins from San Nicolas Island to see if we can start to form sort of a stylistic baseline almost to see how these whistles and hairpins sort of fit into that pattern to give us a better idea if these are for sure Nicolaino um, artifacts. Um, and lastly, I'd like to take those whistles from other people's comparative collections and sort of, if I have the opportunity um, to speciate them, um, which will sort of tell us if the Nicolaino had a particular type of, type of bird or types of birds that they chose to use to make whistles. Um, and it'll also sort of help us understand the overall utilization of birds on the Channel Islands. So I'd like to say thank you to everybody who made this project possible. And that's it.